Someone can be right in front of you, and you wouldn't even know that they were the one for you. This is a movie about a meet-cute, exploring depression, therapy, self-love, and relationships, all in a poetic manner. Ray Pelletier and Melanie Brunet are neighbors in Paris. They must be in their early 30s. They walk past each other on a bridge, take the same train to work and do groceries from the same store. But they don't know each other. Never say hello. Never notice each other. Melanie is a research scientist in an oncology lab, looking at histology slides and carrying biochemical tests. Ray stocks boxes in a big warehouse. We see them on adjacent seats on the train to work. Both of them look pale and colorless. Melanie yawns while working in the laboratory. She tells her colleague about her disturbed sleep pattern. She has been oversleeping lately. This worries her. Her colleague thinks it might be a sign of some mental illness. Melanie doesn't agree. Ray learns he and his colleagues are being replaced by robots to do the job. So many of them will be fired. Someone he knows in the warehouse has found a way to keep Ray in the job and also get him promoted. Ray doesn't look happy. He sits in the locker room silently listening to his colleagues talking about getting fired and cursing the robots. At the off time, we see them traveling back home on the same train. Same melancholy on their faces. They reach their flats. Ray grabs his beer and comes out on the balcony. Melanie comes to her balcony holding an apricot. Their balconies are side by side, open to rail tracks in front and high buildings of Paris. Today Ray is supposed to meet the HR director from the warehouse. It is an interview for a promotion. The director asks him to define himself in one word. Ray doesn't know how to answer that. He talks incoherently and gesticulates. The director suggests the one word to be bubble, seeing Ray form a bubble with hand gestures. Ray is offended at the director for saying he is a bubble. The director is regretful and proceeds to the next question, asking Ray if he will choose to be a leader or follower in his position. Ray isn't making any sense with his answers. Meanwhile, Melanie is running the tests when she overhears his seniors talking. One of them says he doesn't find Melanie qualified enough to do a certain task. Melanie sees her coming to talk to her. He says she will be presenting her research findings to some board members and donors. Melanie looks nervous. She says she isn't qualified enough for such an important task, the exact words he had used in discussion outside. The senior says she can do it. Melanie nods in agreement. Both are in a pharmacy. Melanie is here to buy pills so that she can sleep less. Ray wants pills so that he can sleep properly. Later that night, Melanie takes her pill and sits in her bed to read her study material. She is yawning in no time and falls asleep. Ray has taken his pill and lies down to sleep. But he can't, so he stays awake till morning. He is on the train to work. A little girl is looking his way and smiling sweetly. He returns her smile. All of a sudden he feels dizzy and collapses. Passengers have gathered around him. Medical care arrives. He has opened his eyes and says he is okay. He is taken to the hospital. The doctor says he looks okay, and asks if he is under any kind of stress. Ray says none as such. The doctor asks about family and work. Ray looks faded and his speech is full of pauses but he keeps saying that all is okay. The doctor senses something and suggests he visit a psychotherapist. Ray is sitting in the waiting area outside a psychotherapist's office, J.B. Mayer. Ray looks at other patients, silent, lost, looking out of their element. Mayer calls for Ray. Ray enters the office. It is a very institutional, unwelcoming and to the point room. Mayer pulls out a seat for himself to sit face to face in front of Ray. He has taken out a notepad and a pen and looks at Ray. The silence between the two is deafening. Ray seeing Mayer waiting for him to say something says he doesn't know. Mayer says he is the one who is going to speak first. Ray says he finds it incomprehensible that just talking to a therapist can help him sleep well. Mayer says yes, that is one outcome. Expressing the pain can make it easier to handle. Ray scoffs. He says he isn't crazy. It is because his doctor asked him to talk to someone. Mayer says he is that someone. Ray asks again if therapy can really do what sleeping pills do. Mayer says had his sleeping pill helped him, he wouldn't be here. Mayer asks Ray about the panic attack he had. Ray says he doesn't know why it happened and asks if it is because of depression. Mayer asks if he feels depressed. Ray always looks flustered and out of words when asked a question. He says he doesn't know if he feels depressed, it is just that he is alone. Ray changes his sentence quickly from I am alone to I reside alone. Mayer asks him to describe how he feels lately. Ray asks if it should be in one word and says a bubble. Melanie is also meeting a therapist. She is in her office, a cozy one with a sofa divan, drapes, and floral painted walls. Her therapist shakes Melanie's hand warmly and invites her to take a seat across from her desk. Melanie is in tears talking about George, her ex-boyfriend. They were together for three years until a year ago when he broke up with her. Melanie wonders if it is because her father abandoned her mother when Melanie was a child. These two devastating events are interlinked in her depressed head. She whimpers while talking about it. She says it is difficult to be happy without him. The therapist asks her if it is her father or George she is referring to. Melanie says she doesn't care about her father. She hardly sees him. The therapist lights up a cigarette and talks while blowing the smoke. She says to Melanie that she deserves to be happy and to fall in love again. Comprehending a problem may not always solve the problem but as a starter, Melanie needs to comprehend the problem. The above two scenes are shown running parallel to each other. Beautiful knitting. 
We see both of them returning home after therapies. They are lost in thoughts. Ray enters a store he usually shops at. He grabs a sauce jar. The shopkeeper standing at the checkout comes to him quickly and suggests him another sauce. Ray smiles and says it is more expensive. The shopkeeper says it is better as well. The shopkeeper of this store knows how to sell and what to sell. He knows his customers and their tastes. He has customized recommendations for each of them. Ray leaves with his sauce and Melanie enters the store for olives. The shopkeeper tells her that high-priced olives are the best ones. She says she will take the best ones then. Ray has called his parents but it turns out to be a very difficult conversation. Although it could have been very simple. Ray asks them to put Lauren on the phone, his brother may be. Lauren suggests he be on Facebook to befriend people. Melanie is also on call with her friend. She says Melanie should join social media and sign up on dating sites because her therapist was implying this. She needs to meet new men. Ray sits on his bed with his laptop and starts making his Facebook account. Meanwhile, Melanie has her two friends over at her place who are helping her create and use an account on a dating site. She will go through men's profiles and click like on which one she likes. If that guy likes her back, they can chat and plan a meetup. Ray received a friend request from a guy named Matthew Bernard last night, who claimed to be Ray's schoolmate, and now they are meeting each other in a cafe. Matthew is talkative and a crazy one. He is recalling every insignificant memory of school life in an attempt to help Ray remember him. Ray isn't sure if he knows him from school. Matthew insists that they have been school friends for sure. Matthew has drawn the attention of the entire cafe with his loud talk. Matthew says he was known as a hard drive for remembering every tiny detail. Now Ray remembers. In his next session with Mayer, Ray sits unable to tell anything about himself. Mayer is looking at him, waiting for him to speak. Ray doesn't think there is anything interesting about him. Melanie is going through profiles on dating apps. She finds one who looks cute. There she is meeting him. He sits there, saying nothing at all. He just laughs a bit and clinks his glass with hers. All he said was that she is the one he needed all his life. Melanie cringes. Afterwards, her experience has her friend in fits of laughter. Her friend asks why didn't Melanie just leave, seeing him not worthy of time. Melanie says she couldn't. She is too courteous to prioritize herself. Melanie, in her next session, discusses this with her therapist. Her problem of pleasing other people. Her habit of never being able to say no. The therapist says a weakness can turn out to be a strength at times. Melanie says it was her being nice all the time that ruined her love life. She loved George insanely, never said no to him in any matter. She worshipped him and considered herself nothing in front of him. With him, life was a fairy tale. He cherished her, and she was passionate until it all started waning. Their daily routines and the reality of life got in the way. George had no place for her anymore. And it has been a year of constantly ruminating over good times and crying. The therapist says Melanie should let herself know that it is over and grieve in that context. Melanie doesn't want to forget George. The therapist says she doesn't need to forget a sad memory. Grieving is about accepting the sadness but not letting it burden you. It is Christmas time. Catherine Brunnett, Melanie's sister, is going to see their mother. She has dropped by to convince Melanie for one last time to come along with her. Their mother resides in Amiens with her new husband. Melanie doesn't talk to or meet her. Melanie says she could have come to meet them in Paris if she wanted. Catherine says Melanie will be alone on Christmas so she should just come. Melanie is adamant about staying back. Catherine says she isn't looking for herself lately and she should seek help from a therapist. Melanie says she is already doing that and it is helping. As for Ray, he has gone to spend Christmas time with his family in the countryside. He has a large family. Everyone has gathered at his parents. Everyone greets Ray and asks how he is. But nobody stops to hear his answer. Ray looks like a gray hue among a rainbow. He is mute. There is life around him but he fails to cope. Finally, his father asks him again how he is. Ray says he is depressed and is seeing a therapist. The elders at the table fall silent and look at him. His mother says he isn't a lunatic to see a therapist. Ray tries to make her understand that depression isn't about going nuts. It can be a lurking sadness, a mental state and a tough phase. After dinner, they go out to hike on hills. Snow has covered everything. There is a cemetery on the other side of the hill. Ray wants to go there but his parents never go there. They don't let anybody from the family go there. Back in Paris, Melanie is at the store for organic eggs. At the checkout, the shopkeeper hands them a flyer. It is about a compa class. Melanie is in the club, dancing to music with her friends. And then she stops. Gets out, goes home and smokes on her balcony. Ray has taken his pills and comes to stand on his balcony. Melanie's cigarette smoke is coming in his direction. Ray wakes up from a nightmare, a disturbing dream where he is stuffed inside a box in a warehouse, and robots are working there. Ray gets up to answer the door knock. A neighbor is there to ask him to adopt an extra cat her daughters have. Ray refuses but she thrusts the cat into his arms. The cat's cuteness melts him and he takes it. He plays with it and gets cat food from the store. The good one, based on the store owner's recommendation, of course. Melanie is in the bathtub lip syncing to a sad song. Ray hears it through the thin wall. He feels attracted to the lyrics and melody. Ray plays it. Melanie hears the same song being played on the other side of her wall. She is confused and amused at such a coincidence. Ray sees the cat trying to get out of the window. 
he pulls it back inside and asks it to stay with him. The next day, Melanie and Ray walk past each other on a bridge. Melanie is practicing her presentation with her colleague who asks her to take it easy. There are still two months until then. Melanie is anxious since there are going to be almost 30 people in front of her to listen to her presentation. Ray has found a job at a call center. It is his first day and he is taking his first call under a senior's supervision. There is an old lady on the line who doesn't know her order details. Ray is kind and pays attention to her irrelevant talks. His supervisor instructs him to stay focused. He finds a lively and sociable girl in his workplace, Jenna. They are having lunch together at work. She says men are of three types. Nice but uninteresting like a chicken nugget attractive but dominating like hamburgers. And the third type is cheeseburgers who are modest and sensitive. She says Ray is a cheeseburger and she likes cheeseburgers. Ray smiles. Jenna wonders why he talks so little. He says it is only because of his sleeplessness. Ray names his cat Nugget and plays with it all day after work. He kisses it, trains it to its new name and chats with it. He watches dance videos on his laptop with Nugget. He wakes up the next day and can't find Nugget anywhere. He is in a session with Mayer. He thinks Nugget must have been hit by a car and expired. He blames himself for this. Mayer asks him what makes him so sure that Nugget has really met an accident. He should train himself to think positively. Mayer goes on to tell Ray that he is suffering from depression. Thankfully it isn't a clinical one. Mayer asks what Ray felt after the cat disappeared. Ray says he feels he is some sort of bad luck. Mayer says he wants Ray to think about events that made him reach that opinion of him and be back for the next session. He also asks Ray to spend time with Jenna besides work. Ray is afraid that he will let her down. Mayer asks him to have some faith in himself. In parallel to the above mentioned scene, we see Melanie finding Nugget near dustbins outside the building. She pats it and says she would have adopted it, if only she hadn't been a sad person and so busy. She goes upstairs to her flat, thinks of something and then comes down to pick up Nugget. Ray has invited Jenna to his place tonight. Jenna is standing outside his building. We see Melanie pass by on her way to the store. She is going to get cat food. Jenna enters Ray's flat. He gives her beer. She looks around at his place. There is a dance video paused on his laptop. She plays it and asks Ray if he likes dancing. He says he likes to watch it. There are charts and models of vehicle engines in his room. He says he is a nerd about engines and motors. He explains to her how a combustion engine works. She listens keenly as he talks passionately about engines. They are squatting near models talking. Jenna loses her balance and places her hand on Ray's knee for support. Ray looks at her and leans in to kiss her. She steps away and says she is leaving. Ray apologizes. She leaves. Melanie is lying on the divan and talking about her online dating experiences to her therapist who has dragged a seat near the divan. Melanie says it has become so easy to meet people through online sites but she feels she doesn't want any of that now. She is acting like George, meeting many men and socializing a lot. The therapist asks if she really had a deep connection with George. Melanie asks what is her definition of a deep connection. The therapist answers, deep connection isn't a planned one. It just happens. Online social sites provide instant gratification but not a real, meaningful connection. The therapist says Melanie needs someone who can build that kind of connection with her. Melanie wakes up from a nightmare. She has a lot of guys from dating sites gathered at her place and out of nowhere her mother arrives. Melanie wakes up to answer the door. Catherine is here to see her. She wants Melanie to meet her boyfriend, Amory. Melanie is too preoccupied with her presentation speech to listen to Catherine. Melanie keeps practicing it with her sister and then her colleague. The funding for her research lab depends on her. In parallel, Jenna apologizes to Ray for behaving unreasonably last night. Ray says it is fine. She says everything got confusing but she did want him to kiss her. Ray is confused. Jenna asks her to meet at a place tonight. He looks happily willing for it. Later that night, he reaches the address Jenna told him. It is a dancing class. He sees her through the door glass, dancing and enjoying. He smiles and wants to join. He extends his arm to turn the knob but retreats and comes back to his flat. He instead watches funny and cute videos of cats on his laptop. Tomorrow is the big day for Melanie. She tries to grab some sleep but can't. She starts going through profiles again and ends up inviting a guy, Stevie, over to her place. They make love and drink too much. Melanie realizes that she has to be up early. She asks Stevie politely that he should leave. She throws up on the floor, runs to the bathroom and throws up more. Stevie answers Catherine's call on her phone. He tells her that Melanie isn't feeling well. Catherine is having dinner with Amory. She comes running to Melanie's place with him. They ask Stevie to leave. Melanie wants Amory to leave as well. She then drags Melanie into the shower and puts her into bed. She stays with her till morning, wakes her up, and goes to the research center with her. She forces her to drink maximum coffee. It is going to be her presentation in a few minutes. And she does well. She delivers her findings confidently. She adds a personal touch at the start of her presentation. In fact, her starting line is what her therapist said, a weakness can be a strength. This evening, Melanie and Ray are in the store at the same time. The shopkeeper is guiding Melanie and choosing the best rice. Ray, in the other aisle, stands to listen to the shopkeeper making interesting and convincing suggestions. Ray picks up the same type of rice in his cart. 
The shopkeeper is impressed by Ray's choices. The best, the pricey, the classy. The shopkeeper gives him the flyer for compa classes. Ray and Melanie wake up to ambulance sirens and noise. A building nearby has caught fire. People are being evacuated. A fireman wraps a blanket around a little girl who is crying. The fireman asks her if she is okay. She gives a sad smile with tears flowing and nods, saying she is okay. Ray is looking at her and we see he is truly concerned. He looks upset. A burn man is on a stretcher, being dragged out of the building. The little girl and her mother start crying at his sight. It is her father. The firemen say that he is alive and needs to be hospitalized. The mother hugs the little girl and both of them weep. We see tears roll down from Melanie's eyes. She and Ray are standing in the crowd near each other. They look distressed as if this is their pain. Melanie weeps, telling her therapist that she felt sad for the little girl crying for her father. She might not see him again. It brought memories to Melanie. The time when her father left them. She also wept like that little girl because she feared she would never see her dad again. The therapist asks why she doesn't go to meet her father. Melanie says he has his life with his new wife in the USA. The therapist points out that Melanie justifies her father's behavior but doesn't forgive her mother. Melanie says she doesn't know why she dislikes her mother more than her father. She does acknowledge that she has been a responsible mother in bringing her up. Ray weeps, telling Mayor that the little girl reminded him of his deceased sister. The girl was petrified but smiled when the fireman asked her if she was okay. Cecile was seven years old when she was diagnosed with cancer. Ray was ten then. On her last day, she gave a smile to Ray. Since then Ray feels guilty about being alive while Cecile had to leave. He started thinking he is bad luck. Mayor says it is the very reason he left the warehouse job because he blamed himself for his colleagues getting fired. Mayor says he deserves to be happy and alive. Ray smiles. A liberating smile. A look of serenity is on his face. JB Mayer is having his retirement party. Melanie's therapist is also there. Mayer skips away to sit in his therapy room and closes his eyes. He recalls what his patients tell him. Their pains, their fears, their eccentricities. The scattered things they say before they finally express the original pain hidden deep inside of them. Melanie's therapist comes following him and sits with him. He tells her that it will be hard for him to see his last patient tomorrow. He isn't sure if his practice has done any good. Ray visits his parents and sits with them to talk about Cecile. They say it is past and they better not go there. He says no, they should go there. They should grieve over her. It has taken a toll on him. They should have talked about it, cried over it and let it out. Ray gets up and goes to the cemetery his parents always forbade him to go to. He sits beside Cecile's grave. His parents have come there too. Mayer doesn't know that he had lessened three people's pain. His practice definitely had done good. We aren't aware of the positive changes we make with kindness and small actions. Melanie says she is afraid that people will not like her if they know she is seeing a shrink. Her therapist says she has to be herself if she wants an honest and healthy relationship. She needs to be kind to herself and resolve her issues before worrying about others' opinions of her. Mayer asks Ray to do things and be with people without any fear. Ray thanks him. Mayer had Ray as his last patient. Melanie's gate is gay now. She smiles. She has called her mother who is surprised but happy. Ray's cheeks have color in them now. He walks like a living being and smiles often. He does well at indoor rock climbing now. Ray is at the compa class. Melanie is there too. They are paired up to dance. The synchronization and the parallel happenings of their lives in Paris have come to a beautiful amplified result.